trying to figure out a walk around in this area. It's a little tricky because there's some good trails and some good trails. Um, and it was a huge success. Um, and they're just striking photos, and they and they work for visitors of all ages. So, um, just really great. I want to thank Tom and Caroline and Sharon for all the work they've done. Uh, so big. Before I pass it along, I just want to remind everybody that this uh, exhibit is part of a larger effort uh, that includes a diary project on the Longfellow Creek. Uh, so um, I'm, it's my honor to introduce Ken Workman, um, and he's going to kick us off. <laughs> It's the language of the Duwamish people that was spoken a thousand years ago and 2,000 and 3,000 years before that. We've been here for a long time as a people, as a Duwamish. And so it's an honor to be here once again in the Log House Museum. I'm a former board member. And so it's always exciting for me to come to this house because these trees remind me of the time before there was my grandfather who stood on the shores of Alki right over here. And when I say that, I'm really talking about Chief Seattle. So he would be my great, 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 great grandfather. And so in 1851, uh, these trees were probably growing, as most assuredly, some of them must be 50 years old, that these trees were growing in 1851, and most likely right around here. So in, in, in November of 1851, Seattle was standing on the shores of Alki, just right over here, just about 600 feet away, and he said something like, La Lil, which means come ashore. La Lil de Siaya de Shepara Te Alok Come ashore, my friends, onto this ancient land of the Duwamish. And so that was the initial invitation to these strangers, these posted, um, posted is white, these white skinned strangers to come here. 
And so it didn't take very long before the world turned upside down and we were asked to sign a treaty and then move away. But in doing that, he said that the very first thing that we require is unencumbered access to our burial grounds. And you might ask, well, why is Ken talking about this? Well, he's talking about this log house museum. He's talking about the trees that are in the log house museum and perhaps even Longfellow Creek. That's because we know that salmon DNA has been discovered in trees. And how does that happen? Bears eat salmon. And then, of course, bears do their thing in the woods. <laughs> so all that stuff that was in the creek, like the salmon, ends up in the trees. And we know this through modern science. Mm -hmm. And so we know through the studies of Dr. Susan Samarda at the University of British Columbia, that the forest is all intertwined into one great big massive living thing. And that the fungi in the ground, this mycorrhizal fungi, has a relationship with the roots in the trees. That whatever goes down into the ground goes back up into the trees. And so we as Duwamish people have been living and dying here for those millennia upon millennia upon millennia. And so when we're talking about these trees in this house, we're also talking about the ancestors of the Duwamish people through this relationship in the fungi in the ground and the roots of the trees that at a molecular level, we're in this house as Duwamish people. And so it's always a pleasure to come back here because when I see all of these trees, I go, oh yeah, those are my ancestors right there. Because this house was built in 1903 <coughs> and these trees were already 50 years old or so. And some of them even more than that. And so it's my honor to repeat the words that Seattle repeated on the shore right over here 172 years ago. So when he says, La Leo, come ashore, my friends, onto this land, that was the welcome when he said, Gui. This word, Gui, it means invite. And so we say that today, except we realize the world is a much smaller place. And so we say gui gui, and that's still not big enough. So we put hidak on the end of it, which means everybody from around the world. And so today we say as Duwamish people, gui gui hidak to si ayadisha para te alok duwams. That simply means everybody is welcome here on this land of the Duwamish. So just as my grandfather stood on the shore over there 172 years ago, I'm honored and I'm glad to be here today to say those words in the general vicinity, within a few feet. <laughs> <laughs> say those very same thing. And thank you, Tom, for all of your work on Longfellow Creek. He and I wandered up and down that thing. And I was raised right over there on 21st. So if I fell down to the west side of 21st Avenue, I'd fall into Longfellow Creek. And if I fell down the east side, I'd fall into Puget Creek. So, so this is the land of, of our home. So thank you. Um, so, I'm Sharon Lishman, I'm the director of the Duwamish Alive Coalition, which is a coalition of environmental organizations and agencies where we work within the Duwamish watershed. And um, our main purpose, our focus, is to improve the health of the Duwamish waters and lands. And it's a great, we take this as a great honor of being able to steward the land, ancestral lands of the Duwamish tribe and Duwamish peoples. And we take this very seriously. So, um, we, <laughs> I'm kidding us. <laughs> so, um, I just want to express um, Longfellow Creek is one of our areas, um, our focal points. And you, you all are incredibly lucky to have such a special creek in your community. Um, and I've been working with <laughs> Tom for I don't know how long. <laughs> but, you know, I, I hope you really enjoy the exhibit, which shows just the, the multi dimensions of this creek that most people are so unaware of. And most communities don't have a treasure like this in their backyard. 
and it's one that really deserves stewardship. So um, I, with that, I want to introduce one of the organizations that is a great steward of this creek, and that's um, Caroline with mm -hmm. Village Anyway, <laughs> 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 DNDA, Delridge Neighborhood Development um, Association, and she's we work with um, DNDA on many uh, different projects. So I will just go for it. Uh, so my name's Caroline again. I'm the environmental programs director at Delridge Neighborhood Development Association, um, and we have been um, around since 1996. Uh, we're based at the Youngstown Cultural Arts Center, um, for those of you familiar with that. Um, and uh, DNDA was originally founded to um, provide affordable housing in Delridge. Um, it's something that we still do. Uh, we own and operate seven affordable housing facilities um, in the neighborhood. And uh, in addition to that, we provide a lot of art programming, um, especially for youth. Um, and, and then we have our nature programs, um, which is what I oversee. And we do restoration work. Um, historically, we focused a lot on the West Wamish Green Belt, uh, where we still work. Uh, but back in 2016, we shifted a lot of our efforts over to Longfellow Creek. Um, because as Sharon was talking about, it's a very important creek uh, for the community. Um, and there is a lot of work to be done there. Um, Longfellow Creek is also important um, because we we not only do restoration work there, but it's a place where we bring community. So we um, bring youth there um, to teach them about the plants and the wildlife and just sort of build a sense of place um, for them. And uh, we do art projects there. Um, yeah, it's just a really special place for the community. Um, and uh, yeah, we. Um, we also, we work with volunteers on Longfellow, so if anyone is interested um, in helping the efforts there, uh, we host events every Tuesday and Saturday. Um, and uh, in addition to, we work pretty much up and down the entire creek, um, but another focus is at Rocks Hill, uh, which is the historic headwaters of Longfellow. Um, there's a lot more information in that back corner there about Rocks Hill. Um, but yeah, so if you have any questions uh, about sort of the restoration efforts or programming that's happening, um, we'll also be hosting a guided hike uh, in August um, of Longfellow. Uh, so you're all welcome to join that. Um, and then we will be here on July 8th uh, with one of our teaching artists um, doing sort of a eco art activity, um, sort of focus on Longfellow and the salmon. Cheryl, would you like to please? Oh, you're looking at me. I thought you were in charge. Hey everyone, I'm Cheryl Shapiro, and I was very honored to um, be invited to come tonight. It's really um, just a delight. Um, I'm a little bit choked up about it because um, I worked on Longfellow Creek for about 12 years. Mm -hmm. I started in 1995 and um, worked for the city of Seattle and just had a wonderful time. I consider that one of the highlights of my, of my work, um, of building partnerships with community and all kinds of um, people in the community. So whether it be businesses or students from little ones up to um, South Seattle Community College, um, working with the steel mill, working with different artists, um, the Salmon Bone Bridge, working with um, all different departments within the city too, trying to integrate all the talents and care and vision for this beautiful place that, um, as Sharon said, is a treasure in the community. And um, when I started in 95, um, the creek was a wreck. Um, fortunately, the Parks Department um, was able to buy a lot of acreage all along the creek in the late 80s. And it was um, just overgrown with every type of invasive plant. Um, anything you did not want to see to take a walk, it was there. And at the time, I was uh, my office was up at Camp Long. 
And um, my position was created from um, the second um, urban watershed plan in the state um, in 1992. And part of their recommendations was to have a position that was watershed education. And what did that mean? So to, to bring awareness about the creek, to have access to the creek, to make it safe for people to enjoy, and also to improve habitats, to reduce flooding. So all different types of goals. and different people would gravitate to one or more of those things. So how, how to do that? So over time, just by <coughs> being in community, going to lots of community meetings, as Carolyn mentioned, DNDA formed in 96. So that was just when I was getting started. And um, I think back on some of you may have known Vivian McLean, matriarch of Delridge. Um, when I first started my job, she threw me in her car and drove me all around the neighborhood and showed me you know, a little sign that if you see it when you come off the West Dale Bridge, it still says, welcome to Delridge, home of Longfellow Creek. And Greg Davis Park was named after Greg Davis, who left in his estate um, enough money for Parks Department to buy that acreage. And so, so many people, individuals and businesses, communities, students have all come together to really create the creek, what it is today, the Longfellow Creek Legacy Trail. Um, that was a dream that came true. Um, because of a lot of different efforts, things that were on that many people voted for on the parks levy, other people that contributed their endless volunteer hours. And so um, it's really thrilling for me to see all of you here, um, people that have perhaps lived here for a long time, and young people, and what a delight to hear about all the students that came today. And um, as Carolyn said, there's still a lot of work to be done. There's a lot that has been done. There's a great structure there. And so I invite you and encourage you to dream big and think about like how can we really have this creek be known even more and find your way to connect to it, whether it be through art or science or writing or just, just being there. Um, my favorite place is Brandon Street on one of the little bridges um, in the fall to see the vine maples turning colors. So I encourage you to go down. You'll find salmon there too in the fall. Um, volunteer work there for counting them and seeing who's coming back and how we can better protect them. And thank you to Tom for these amazing photographs that just bring that hidden world and also an accessible world to all of us. So thank you. we had a couple hours because I would love to introduce everyone to everyone else here because there's some people from everywhere that I, and I know of and different, have different reasons for being here. So um, I'm really appreciative of all of that. Um, thank you first, Elizabeth. Thank you. This was Anne, Clara, Caroline. Carol, thank you very much for being here. It's very special to me. And, Thank you for sharing all this. I, um, let's see. What I wanted to say was to explain the exhibit in the pictures a little bit was that, um, so the reason behind this, behind the pictures, is that when I was working on the book about the Duwamish River, I knew a little bit about Long Philip Creek, but never really got here, and I didn't understand what was happening here. And I, um, just started coming and thinking about and learning little bits of knowledge, little facts that I um, couldn't quite put them all together and understand um, what was happening. So um, as, a, as things happen, you probably have the same experience. You get curious, you go ask yourself questions, you find some answers, and then there's more questions. And um, this is certainly 
a landscape that <laughs> inspires all of that because it's uh, as beautiful as it is, it's many other things as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess what why this exists is because you get to understand something a little bit, you start caring about it, and then you sort of think, well, what can I do? Um, and this is sort of what I know to do, is <laughs> to take pictures and to share them, tell the story a little bit in a certain way, and what we're hoping for is that this is the beginning of um, being able to share what's going on at Longfellow Creek, trying to connect it with what's going on at place, in places like it, um, in the city, um, way beyond um, into the world. Um, I allow myself to think about this because we know that salmon are here. They spend most of their lives in the ocean, right? And so everything that happens um, throughout their life, whichever environment they're in, um, has a bearing on, on how they live and how we benefit from them um, coming back. And um, so what I would say is when, I, when I've when i been photographing, I experience these sometimes <laughs> um, quite surprising, stunning uh, moments. Um, and and I, the only thing I can think of is that they're sort of astonishing to me. And so I think of the story as kind of in a series of <clears throat> astonishments that one leads to the next. And maybe that's just because I don't, I'm not aware of everything that why they're so astonishing, but they, I mean, I would have never thought um, that there were salmon spawning inside the city limits of Seattle still to this degree. <coughs> and so the questions about that are, when you ask them, um, sort of can't let go of the fact that it's a relationship between the people who are here, the rest of the natural world, which we are a part of, and we forget that often. And when we remember, we think, whoa, <laughs> you know, this is sort of uh, what I do, this is my life, this is their life, but it's also um, together people and the other thing, other plants, the animals, um, the <clears throat> soil, everything here is related, which we uh, have to remind ourselves sometimes about to remember that. Um, but it really stands out when you're in a place like this and you see that this, you know, Longfellow's a green corridor, right? One of very few. Um, all kinds of life lives here. Lots of kinds of life pass through here uh, and depend on it when they're migrating. Migrating birds, migrating salmon. Um, there might be some kinds of um, <coughs> the insects that are here are you know, incredible and you don't think about them, but they are certainly vital. And then we learn, well, the insects that are here are uh, diminishing. You know, so what does that mean? You know? um, so anyway, I also experience these photographs and these moments as gifts. And I hope that this is kind of, I mean, there's an incredible amount of energy in this room to me, <laughs> uh, which I really appreciate. I hope the pictures are contributing to the energy a little bit. I hope there's some kind of a reciprocal thing going on here. Um, it really is special to me to feel that from everybody. Um, well, in the way of these being gifts. So Sharon, I have some, we have some food for you, because if, we, if it weren't for Sharon, we would not be here. It was her brilliant idea to bring these stories to people, um, and we want to go beyond the museum at some point and just see how people will come to the story and how, um, where that might lead, because we know that's sort of the keys to making places better is that you build community, you build people who care, and we're constantly looking for ways that that, that that happens. And so people, you know, people ask me, what, well, what can I do? And my answer you generally is, well, what do you like to do? I mean, what could you, how can they ask you, well, how can I contribute? And I think, well, the creek needs everything. <laughs> I mean, really, it's in, the, it's in that state that whatever you would want to give um, would make a difference. I mean, it would make a difference to you as well, I guess. 
So I'm sorry, back to Sharon. So thank you, Sharon, for bringing us all together and having this idea. So. And this is a, I know this is like way over the top, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's my flower. <laughs> so what is that flower, Sharon? Uh, and where is it? Okay. <laughs> This is, okay, I have to tell you this. Is, well, first of all, the reason I'm gonna beg Tom to, <laughs> a bit um, to do these exhibits is really for his work in the, in the Green Duwamish River. And if, you know, and I know as you're experiencing his photos, your photos were actually an inspiration to me to like let's let's do something there. Mm -hmm. So actually, you are the seed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just kind of followed you. Yeah. But I have to say, this is a um, a fawn lily up at Rocks Hill, and it is it only comes out for a couple <coughs> weeks, and then it dies. Mm -hmm. So Rocks Hill is actually such a special place. Um, it's a like a 10,000 year old bog and um, I won't go into the history but to go up there in the spring and you'll see like the trillium and this special lily which I dearly love and I get really excited about which people think wow this lady is a little crazy <laughs> but I would um, thank you so much you it, it's gonna be my favorite Monica. <laughs> I do thank you, but I do um, hope that you do visit Rocks Hill at some point, um, mm -hmm. especially in the spring. It's it's magical. Thank you. Let's see. So, a couple more things I want to do. So, one is um, the latest salmon report from Longfellow Creek. Um, so, six days ago, there are um, at least. 37 coho fry about this big, still alive in Longfellow Creek. Um, and they're, let's see, right about this time, probably the beavers are going to be out and about, right? Pamela, Pamela is back here. You should know yeah, Pamela. Yep. Another hour. <laughs> Before they come out. <laughs> so Pamela's been following the beavers not only here, but she does amazing work trying to get people and beavers to respect each other. Um, and it's really, it's really amazing. She knows what's going on with her. Um, our local band, how many are there now? Uh, there's three families. And three then families. I think two of them just had one at three kids, so I know Claude and two down at Nancy, and then they kind of move them out to the golf course. <laughs> three families of beaver and about two kilometer you know daily stretch. Yeah, very cool. So we'll be seeing them dispersing two or three years like we did International Beaver Day when left and tried to find some place to go. Founded them up later on the beach by the leaf to cut. I took it in, his suffered, we got it to spawners and they put it down, but it was an injury on its back, so it probably got hit and done before. Um, so we gotta keep our eyes out, we have a you know, plan for this to happen. Thank you. Um, let's see. Okay, so we have a party game tonight, if you like, and you can pass these around and you can challenge yourself because um, so so much of understanding the creek is counting fish. Okay, um, adults, but now um, here's here's what it looks like in the pool. Pass it around. This is the this is the deepest <laughs> part that's left really at the moment um, below the beaver dam. So the beavers created this pool. The coho salmon fry are using it. So the the, the game is count count the coho. <laughs> and then, so my answer is on the back. So you can challenge yourself however you want. Um, <laughs> And I'm not convinced I'm right, so um, whoever wants to take a guess. How long did it take you to count them when you were looking at the picture? <laughs> Quite a while. And this, is, this, is, this is not all of them that are down there, but this is the most I could get in one, one photograph. So. Oh, is that the beaver dam at Grant Street? Uh, no, this is the one. Yancey. Yancey Street. Oh, yeah. So the big one. Um, so the same thing. Here's another spot on the. Creek. 
Get the canvas, see how many are in this one. How many little baby salmon are in this one? Two different places. This is further down. But anyway. Uh, so the only other, the other thing I want to do was sort of um, I thought how to, thinking about how to answer the question about why why I want to be that's interesting and why I wanted to explore it. Um, I was going to read. Let's see. Here's a these are some fun facts okay, and fun is in quotes. Um, I don't all have answers, but. Um, See if these things that you learned, like I did, might be intriguing to, to some degree. Um, oh, okay, so we'll start with Bog, um, which you can read all about on those signs. So the fun fact, one fun fact to think about is a few years ago, Rocks Hill Bog, incredible wetland, been here eight or 10,000 years probably, uh, it caught fire. So, it's a wetland catching fire. Um, it's more than that, but that's uh, something that caught my interest. Um, so the salmon in Longfellow Creek, um, why are they here? When did they catch on fire? Uh, 2017 maybe? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Seattle Fire Department didn't know how to put out the fire exactly, so they called the fire department in Scotland. <laughs> so, how do you put out a peak fire? Yeah. 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 <laughs> they did, so the national. Yeah. Um, so the salmon that we see here, are the adults coming back, still come back every year. When at the time Cheryl's talking about, was just at the beginning of the time when people were thinking about bringing salmon back. Because it had been, there had been no salmon in the creek, zero, for 50 or 60 years. They were blocked, so they couldn't get in. Um, the steel plant had a diversion dam and other things down low in the creek, so there were none. Hmm. And this is after the creek had been this amazing salmon spotting creek. Well, I'd say eons. <laughs> um, so there was a decision made to try to see what could happen if you took the barriers out. And the story is that the salmon came back immediately into the creek. Um, hmm. We also think about the story of the salmon being that they're born, hatched in one place in fresh water. They go out to the ocean for the cold for a couple of years, two or three years. They come back and spawn where they were born. Um, my hunch is that there aren't any that are coming back that were born in Longfellow Creek. Um, so what are the ones that are here doing? We don't know for sure. Um, what I understand, or my understanding of what people have said is that they probably, they are, they're still doing, they're not lost. They're, they're doing probably what they should be doing, which is straying. So this is a survival strategy for a species of salmon that not everyone goes back to where they came from um, because if you have a species that are going back to the same place exclusively to something that happens to that place, well, what do you do, right? Yeah. So, and how did they get here in the first place? There weren't salmon until the glaciers left and there were new streams. So somehow they found their way. So there's something that's salmon come back, they come into Elliott Bay and they flip a right <laughs> to come in come into you know the Seattle area. And, this, and the first place they encounter that has fresh water is Longfellow Creek. Wow. So um, are there hatchery fish? Some, some years many, some years fewer. Um, but we just don't know for sure where they are all from, and yet they're still coming. They're still trying to spawn. So, um, so the other, okay. So the related to one fact is that to get to the creek, they have to go through a pipe. 
Okay, they come back in, they come in the sand, they, they sense fresh water. So they have to go into the pipe, which is a big concrete culvert. They decide to go in. And that pipe goes for two thirds of a mile underground. There are some skylights in there, sort of. Um, but it's, they have to swim through there underneath the steel plant, underneath the Busia Bridge. Um, and they probably have to do a jump or two inside that pipe because of the way the construction of the, of the pipes are there. Um, and then they get eventually to daylight in the creek. And so, holy cow. <laughs> um, but they do it. Um, yeah, so the other, the other related salmon uh, fun fact is that, yes, there are these um, topo that survive in Longfellow Creek. So they, they're conceived in November. They uh, are in a nest underneath in the bottom of the creek covered in gravel for three months, four months. And they're growing or they're covered with silt that comes down in those huge floods. Um, during the winter, and yet they survive to emerge in the spring. They're about like this, right? Some of them even have their vestiges of their yolk sacs still um, as they emerge, and then they, there they are. They don't have parents to take care of them. They don't have anybody to show them what to do, right? So they're just in the creek and they're fending for themselves, and somehow there's enough food that's dropping from trees or all the little creatures that are in the creek that are that have larvae and eggs and um, but somehow this year there I counted not science but I counted about 108 <coughs> baby coho um, and like I said so this six days ago there are at least 30 some still mm. but so the other the, the least fun fact is that. Most of the adults that come back to spawn die before they can spawn because they are, they're poisoned. And um, so that's a really, that's the hard fact of Longfellow sin. Um, it's still happening. And um, anybody know why? Have you heard the story? Do we know what's, what's going on there? Tired. Somebody said tired. <laughs> yes. Um, so the good part of this is that we now know, as of like a year and a half ago, what it is that is killing the salmon before they can spawn. So, okay, I must mention this. So, um, for a long time, this everybody knew that this is what was happening. <coughs> Every year, there's volunteers from the Puget Sound Keepers. Now we're doing a study. Um, people go out, volunteers go out every day during spawning season and they count fish, the salmon that come back. Um, they look at them and examine them. They do a necropsy and sort of try to figure out whether the females have spawned yet, whether they still have all their eggs or part of their eggs or whatever. So, based on that, they know. How many survived long enough, or likely how many survived or not? Um, so they knew that this, but most of them, at this point, uh, are not going to make it to to spawn. Very high per, high percentage of pre-spawn mortality. So, but like I said, the good part of this is that we now know because some brilliant scientists have been doing this research for years and years and years and finally figured out, well, they knew it was in stormwater eventually. There's something coming through stormwater and into the creek. So this is all the water that runs off of streets and parking lots and um, carries with it whatever is on those streets and parking lots. And so they knew there was something in there and they couldn't, they couldn't pinpoint it though forever. Um, but they finally did. And it was, it's a substance that it is created in tires, okay, tires wear out, the dust from the tires um, is exposed to air, and there's a substance created 
six PTBD quinone, quinone, um, and coho salmon in particular are susceptible to this, which is actually basically poisons them when they're exposed. And that's um, been happening now for you know all this time that they've been coming back. <coughs> But the good part of that is, since now we know what that is, right? And we can try to figure out, maybe, how to stop the poisoning the salmon. Right? And there are things to figure out. And there's an equally, another positive part of this is that some other brilliant scientists have done all this work to figure out how a really damaged stream, ecosystem, like this one, could possibly be restarted, reclaimed, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, well, Catherine's not here, I guess. Yeah, Catherine's here. She is. Hi, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> She's hiding. <laughs> Catherine. So, we're going to mention Catherine Leish. Yay! Um, Yay. Um, <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for all your incredible work. It's really hard to explain briefly what we know. Catherine. Um, the Piper Ridge, so yeah. <laughs> so Catherine's a uh, biologist. Uh, right, right. They have worked for many, 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 many years on many of these creeks, and Longfellow included. Maybe he's been in particular. Um, Thornton Creek project was something that she coordinated. Wow. She got all these really smart people together. Um, and she'll talk about her team, which is true. Um, but they figured out how a creek functions um, better than we've ever known, is, what I, is the way I would think. <laughs> Fair? Uh, <laughs> we're, we're covering um, a very, very damaged creek, and, um, and but trying to restore a natural process so that the creek can sustain itself. And we experimented with an engineered stream bed and basically kind of hit on something. Um, by restoring the connection between surface water and groundwater. That mm -hmm. turns out to be really important. So this was Thornton Creek, all the work they did there to, to improve it. Right, and, the, and the way the structure, the, the, the way it was structured, the way they figured out the water moves over logs and into pools and the, the importance of all of those processes is that there's a layer of water below where we would think there was one when you look at the at the bottom of the creek, but there's water around it and below it, and in that space is where much of the life is. And so they figure out basically how to recharge that part of the ecosystem, correct? Mm -hmm. And right. so you, you create all of the little, <laughs> the little life, the benthic creatures that live down there that are the foundation for much of what is um. dependent on them. So, um, and it's worked. And it's I mean, this, worked. Is, this is what I'm saying. This is um, incredible work. And the uh, Creek is one that doesn't have this um, uh, the advantage of having been cared for as well yet. Yet. Uh, mm -hmm. and but it it's actually slated for one of the future projects. Right. Okay. So this is. Um, I'm looking for the fun facts and the things that are positive for everybody. Yes. So one of the, the fun facts mm -hmm. um, is the chemist that did the work on looking at how the engineered stream bed treated the stream water and how much of it was treated and treated in a way that could, uh, uh, you know, address the tire chemical. Um, is the same chemist um, that uh, that discovered the his team that discovered the six PPD quinone. So he did both the performance monitoring on the Thornton projects and this discovery. Okay. So are you saying that that uh, stuff that's in the ground will filter out the the chemical? You can actually treat it. Um, and treat yeah, it. And there's a couple of mechanisms, and one that's really important is that every piece of gravel is covered with a biofilm of microbes um, and bacteria, good bacteria, good and like a mixture. And that actually can break down those contaminants. As is rain gardens. Yeah, so if you're and rain gardens. About and what, what you could do in your own home, in your own garden, <coughs> you can create small little rain gardens to capture the runoff from your driveways. 
And that, when that, that runoff, the polluted runoff goes into a rain garden, just like Catherine's saying, the soil actually breaks down the, um, the really poisonous part of it and cleans it. So this is a, wow. you know, this is a huge breakthrough and it's something that we all can be stewards and do in, on our own properties. So there's solutions here. Yep. Yeah. So, and look up the documentary, Engineering with yeah. Nature. Oh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> Woo yeah. There you go. <laughs> Engineering with Nature. Yeah. Engineering with nature. yeah. So, and I can give people a link to the film. So. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're, we're also hoping is that there's an opportunity to talk more about this and share more information like this mm. um, in a related way to this exhibit because of what we can love with that. An evening where people who are much smarter than I am can come and um, you know share what they've seen and what they do and you know what um, what hope there is in in their work you know, because it's it's uh, like I said it's fairly new and it's incredibly important so thank you for all that. Mm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> A whole team of people, <laughs> a cast of dozens. I mean, including the researchers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it's incredible. But, but it also says, like, from what Sean was saying, Mr. Smith, from Keep It Sound Keeper, is that we use tires everywhere now. You know, they're in play yards. They're now selling it as mulch. Mm. So when you buy tire, that crumbly tire, you know, you see at Home Depot and yes, mm. I, you know, it's you know, it's lovely, but what it does is that that same chemical you're putting into your into your yard, into your ground. So it's so we need to be a little bit more sensitive and conscious of how we're putting tires back into our environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you want to have a few more, or a few questions? Or it's, we're quarter till eight, I want to make sure everyone, we don't, we can, oh, so we, sure. we can stay up until, you know, we can be here for a long time, just to make sure folks that need to leave at eight have a chance. Actually, I'll have to read one more thing. Perfect, you thank you. Mind. I would love to line it up. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm actually going to read part of this. It's very short. But it's, um, recently, in National Geographic, um, I was surprised that uh, there was a story about urban uh, spaces, urban green spaces, how to make how conservation works in, within cities, um, and it sort of capitalizes what like the meaning of Longfellow Creek is and places like it, so if you don't mind, I'll just read it real quickly. Um, urban green space isn't just about making us feel good. Real conservation can occur in these spaces, especially for birds, plants, insects, and other small wildlife. Greenways and urban streams can be corridors through the concrete for plants and wildlife. Sometimes cities can be refuges. Not everyone can afford to visit flagship national parks. Access to nature is not evenly distributed. Fixing that injustice may be the best way to create a generation that cares enough about other species mm. to save them. Conservationists are realizing that their work isn't about protecting other species from people, although limiting access or harvest can at times be necessary. Instead, conservation needs to be about protecting other species with people. It's about improving our relationships with the non-human world, not severing them. Anyway, okay, so you want to do some questions? Sure, or? yeah, yeah. I thought we'd give people a chance before 8 o'clock. Um, <coughs> it's a great, great comment to end on. Um, I got a big question. Yeah, I, I was down there in that thing where you where that picture of that big uh, skeleton of the thing out. Salmon bone bridge. Yeah. Just that screen from there, there's like a drain that comes through the, the uh, golf course. And it comes out and it's a giant pipe that's going straight vertically. Do the salmon actually go through there? Does do the salmon go through there? Yeah. Um, it seems impossible. They can. They have. 
before. I've read <laughs> um, and I've heard. I haven't seen them. But yes, yeah, essentially. I, I have. <laughs> <laughs> so we did uh, spawning surveys, uh, we as in the city of Seattle, um, and from 1999 through about 2007. And so the fish are coming in from the side and then going um, through a culvert under Genesee Way, they get into the golf course. The golf course channel has changed, but during those years, it wasn't a beaver pond. And so there was actually a lot of spawning that occurred, and that was coho salmon and chum salmon. So yes, they can. And you know that structure has to be kept clean in order for the fish to get you know in there. Um, and, um, and, and it is a very strange structure, but it's actually an energy dissipating structure. So there's, a, you know, some... Um, you see the big washout from it. Yeah, yeah. And the other fun fact is that not only salmon go for there, beavers go for there. <clears throat> and you mentioned that sort of pipe <laughs> about the size of their bodies. <coughs> they, they can commute underneath Genesee Street. <laughs> uh, <laughs> through the pipe, the <laughs> golf course, come back. Do you swim close to it with your camera? What's that? You swam close to it with your camera? No. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. Although I did see them take, you know, they're commuting, so they're, I did see some of them packing their lunch. <laughs> they, they'll actually take limbs, tree limbs with them, through that pipe, up and down. I don't know. Who knows? So they're going up through the pipe, you know, against the current, and into the golf course. Well, uh, on the answer to this, each year, do you have a big increase on salmon coming back? Do you have what? Each year, is there a big increase of number of salmon coming back? Uh, Partially, no. no. There's, a, there's generally a decrease in the number of salmon coming back. Yeah. I mean, globally, salmon are in peril um, everywhere, and including here. And uh, there were years, what, there were hundreds and hundreds, right? Right. So um, from 2000 through 2002, those were our highest numbers, and we would see upwards of 500 coho and 100 chump coming mm -hmm. into uh, Longfellow Creek, which was more than Thornton Creek, which is much larger in size, like three, four times the size of, of Longfellow. Mm -hmm. So it, it has the potential to have, you know, a lot. It does have a huge potential. It's not being realized but it does have potential. Yeah. It's worth yeah. saving. Yeah. 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 yeah, in some years, very, very few. Yeah. And then in other years, you know, more. Uh, has much study been done of the dams and potential for uh, removing or making big openings through the dams? Uh, in the Gulf the Genesee. Or John, Genesee. They are. They do get through Genesee. That that culvert does need to be replaced. It probably is a barrier some of the time, but they can. You know, we found they could get through that. But in the golf course, the there's a culvert, uh, the 12th fairway that is a full barrier, and the WPA dam may be a barrier upstream. It's actually um, about 70 feet upstream, and there is a fish ladder built into the face of it. But because the fish can't get through the culvert, we don't know whether the WPA dam is a barrier. Probably the best habitat on the, on the creek, though, is in the golf course. In the golf course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know, the, the, the wooded ravines, nobody goes down there, they, except to chase a golf ball. Um, so not often. And it's, you know, there used to be foxes, red foxes, living in there. And that kind of thing. But, It seems like a million years ago, but in 2016, many of you remember the Supreme Court of the country, anyway, ruled that culverts that impair salmon migration are illegal and have to be dealt with. Can anyone comment on where that is going? I know it's money. It's, it, it's, so the culverts, my understanding is the culverts are on the list to remove, but what I've been told too, that it's a very, very long list. And unfortunately, um, where the culverts in the creek are, the money is, <laughs> is is not there to reach that level on the list. That's what I've been told. So the idea is to fix all the culverts at some point, but 
because it's sort of done in stages, they prioritize the ones that have the most salmon in the stream that you know are blocking the most habitat. So it's just kind of it's going to be a process really to work through that list. They don't all get fixed at once, and the state in particular has been very um, aggressive really about fixing these culverts even on the urban streams. So we have a couple of them, for example, on Thornton Creek that are considered a priority by the tribes and are being worked on. Yeah. With something that's fish passable. So ideally, ideally a bridge, um, but not always. Sometimes it's a much, much broader culvert, so on Taylor Creek in south, um, the south part of the city, there were two three and a half foot culverts, for example, replaced with bottomless arch culverts, which are kind of like bridges. They're like 12 to 14 feet wide. And you know, we just, we see the fish move up immediately as soon as those are in place. Mm. Yeah. Gary had a question. Um, has the culvert So I can't, I can't speak to great detail on that, but I do know that they are very careful and they're working with ecology and I think that is one of the areas that ecology tests. Mm -hmm. And so they really are trying to be mindful of what they're putting on the golf course. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Raku Tharp is the um, superintendent of the grounds and he would be a good person to talk to about that, about details. So tell about your photo agent. Um, over what period of time did you actually take all these photos? Um, and uh, can you tell us a couple of fun facts about your photo collecting uh, techniques? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dan. And the volunteer <clears throat> who caught salmon this year, too. And, uh, uh, let's see. So it's been, let's see, I've seen four salmon spawning seasons now. Um, so I've been doing pictures that, you know, up and on for that period of time. Um, and these are, it's some, as a photographer, sometimes it feels like you have even more access to these salmon because they're in a small creek and they're, it's the water is shallow even though it's really um, murky a lot of the time and it's flooded a lot of the time, but still there are times when it's, um, you know, easier to, to see sort of see what, what's going on and what their behavior is like. Most of the ones underwater are, um, I did with a small, like a, a little GoPro camera, which is, you know, does video and still pictures and it's tiny. Um, I had no, I had to experiment because I had no idea what, how fish would react to it or whatever, you know, there's a big, this huge eye, you know, looking at them. Plus it has, it probably has some sound from and they're sensitive to, you know, magnetic fields, electric, electrical current to some degree, probably. Um, but for some reason, the little ones, um, I think maybe they like the, the slipstream or something because they would hover in front. But it was a little tiny camera um, at the end of a pole, about 10, yeah, 10, it's a 10 foot pole with a, with a camera on the end. And it worked and to create the lenses that sort of worked to get in focus, you know, this far away. <laughs> um, so I had to create that and see how that worked underwater, but it was about the only way to do it. But it's, a, and they can't see what you're photographing. Look at it later. Um, you go, oh, <laughs> I should you know, tip it this way a little bit or whatever. Or, oh my God, I got lucky, you know. So oh, this yeah. is a, you know, this, this guy is about like this probably. So this is the Salmon Bone Bridge. Um, that's the Salmon Bone Bridge. So this one is right below there. Um, and sometimes. You know, it's so much luck and all, but it's luck and patience more than anything. Um, and, then, and the, you know, the larger, the adults that come back, this one, this one, this, one, this uh, I can't even describe what it was like to see salmon actually spawning. Yeah. Um, but they did. This was a pair that, you know, that's the female, and this is like seconds after the, the eggs and the milt were you know, they squeezed them out at the same time in the, in the column of the water. Um, 
and that's where <coughs> fertilization occurs and there's about between the time that they release them from their bodies to the time they're on the bottom 20 seconds something like that maybe and then the eggs are either fertile or they're not so um, but so this is um, I have a video this is from a video you can see the whole sort of <coughs> behavior that they go through to do this so the females on the left the eggs are down so she'll turn around immediately come back over the nest and with her tail um, get the gravel from the sides of it cover it over and then they might go on and do it in another place so it's like you know you don't want all your eggs in one basket so <laughs> <laughs> well it's a survival strategy right you know how would you ever know um, that the one space even though it's very carefully chosen and, and very particular about how the timing works between the two of them. You know, it's somewhat still amazing to me that that happened. Somebody, some of them survived. So downstream, about 30 feet from the following spring is where there were about, mm. I count about 28 or something mm. under a root ball. You know, or from, could have been from here. I don't know. But, um, sure. Again, an astonishment to me because I haven't seen it. How about the wildlife family? Oh, that's true, right. Thank you. Evan, my son. <laughs> this is Chris, my wife, and she's done this a long time ago. So Evan's been, he knows way, 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 way more than most people that want to be I have seen an experience with me, which is I greatly appreciated because it's um, a big help and an inspiration, too. Mm -hmm. But so, yeah, the wildlife came. So we did it, I did it one time. A few times. The yeah, the beaver over here is from home. So a camera you can put out and it automatically takes pictures when there's motion or however you set it. So Alan does this all the time, which is and if you get a chance to see your videos of the beavers, it's really amazing. But, sorry. sorry. It's eight o'clock. I just want to make sure we acknowledge that the event is not over because we're gonna encourage y'all to stay and chat further with Tom and okay. Sharon. Caroline, but this is more than I ever told. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. And I didn't, didn't need to cut him off as abruptly as I just did because no. it's just been a true Somebody pleasure. Needs to, somebody needs to be in charge. <laughs> it's a true pleasure working with everybody here. Um, and as Kathy just acknowledged to me, there's so many stories already coming from all of you about Longfellow Creek. So um, we highly encourage you to uh, visit um, Log House Museum or DNDA's website because we have links to our online diary. And there are people here that we know we want to target. Um, so, you know, there's people here that we'll be reaching out to. Um, or Maggie. Or nagging, yeah, um, Also, just to let you know, we have um, some books of uh, Tom's on the Duwamish for sale here today. It's a beautiful book. Um, and then lastly, if you haven't yet, um, feel free to sign up on your emails outside and we can stay in touch um, and we can send you a direct link to the um, online dive project. So, uh, thank you everybody uh, for coming and huge thank you to everybody involved with things. <laughs>